uh, appreciate the uh, work of the local organizing committee and, uh, and those that invited me to be here. It's, uh, it's an opportunity where I hope I can share some stories with you and maybe later on we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation around uh, not just my work but the whole area of um, microbiomes. And thank you very much for the background on microbiomes. I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. If I could uh, just give you the take home message at the very beginning, I think the important thing I want you to remember is that utilizing plants and their associated microorganisms is an opportunity to enhance remediation and reclamation of contaminated sites. And you can think about this in the context of any type of contaminant, but what I want to focus on today would be petroleum hydrocarbons. This is just a, a brief overview of what I hope to talk about today. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about soil and plant microbiomes. I want to introduce a concept many of you are probably familiar with, by phytotechnologies. I want to talk about some of the challenges of contaminated sites so that you get an appreciation for how difficult some of these sites might actually be. And then I want to tell you three research stories. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about each of those and how uh, my research group has tried to use those uh, research sites to conduct field studies to help us understand how we can manipulate soil and plant microbiomes. And again, that take home message for you to remember. So many times when I would drive down the, uh, the country road, I'd see a field of crops, whatever it might be, and I would tend to uh, forget about the fact that underneath the uh, soil was a wonderful community. And if you pick up a plant, you can see the plant root system as I've shown you here. And if you use an electron microscope, you'll see that the root is covered with bacteria. You can also find a variety of fungal associations that help those plants grow. And these microorganisms are responding to the many root exudates that are released by plants. They're responding to the root architecture, the way the water is attracted to roots. And uh, it's just a wonderful, diverse community. What I've tried to do throughout my talk, and I know you'll have access to uh, some of the slides afterwards as a PDF, is I've inserted some references where I hope you can find some additional information, and I hope they, f they are of use to you as you uh, kind of think about this topic. So I was showing you some bacteria on the outside of the root surface, but um, just like you, uh, plants have microorganisms living inside the, uh, the tissues. And so the root microbiome consists of multiple places. It's the rhizosphere soil right outside the uh, surface of the root. It's the rhizoplane, the root surface itself. And then inside the root tissues, you find a variety of bacteria and fungi that help the plant overcome a variety of stresses, um, whether it be heat or drought, help the plant overcome uh, pathogens, help the plants acquire nutrients, and as I hope I can convince you today, also help the plants degrade various kinds of contaminants. So how can we manipulate the soil root microbiome? Well, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. One way would be to add inoculants. And I've shown you two examples here. One of them is a bacterium inoculant. It's labeled with a, uh, a, a green fluorescent protein. Uh, the second uh, example is a, a root nodule called by a Frankia. It's an actinomycete. It colonizes a select group of trees. It fixes nitrogen. So obviously, it's a very important pioneering um, microorganism. It helps those plants survive in rather difficult, stressful conditions. And the reference there shows some work where it was actually used to remediate contaminated sites. These microorganisms that you might add, they can just be indigenous to the ecosystem where you're working. They could also be genetically engineered. And that's something that obviously you need to think about if you're introducing genetically engineered organisms. What are the impact of those organisms on the ecosystem? And do you have to worry about the you know, release of those organisms to the other parts of the environment? You can amend the soils with various kinds of residues or fertilizers, and that's going to cause changes in the, the soil microbiome. It's going to call different groups of more, it's going to stimulate different groups of microorganisms to grow and proliferate, and so that's important. And of course, finally, you can grow different kinds of crops or plants or rotations. Uh, genetically modified plants, as illustrated here, this is um, genetically modified uh, brassica species. And uh, looking at root microbiomes and looking at the soil microbiome, you can see that uh, introduction of GM plants doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on these, these communities. There are changes, but those are transient changes. And at the end of the day, um, what we want to do is understand what those communities are, how they function, and how we can manipulate them. <laughs> 
Some of you may be familiar with various kinds of phytotechnologies. You can use plants to produce different kinds of chemicals. I think I saw a poster that was talking about doing that yesterday. You can also use plants as agents of phytoremediation. And that's because the plants and their associated microorganisms are able to do a variety of things. I've listed some of them here. The things that happen above ground, phytovolatization of various kinds of chemicals, um, phytodegradation, phytoextraction, Many plants have been used to uh, accumulate metals and salts, remove them from the soil. And then, of course, you have things that happen below the uh, root zone, phytostabilization, where various kinds of chemicals are stabilized and not leaching anymore, uh, rhizodegradation, rhizo where chemicals are actually broken down, and rhizofiltration, where the root system acts like a sponge or a filter and it removes the chemicals before they leach into the groundwater. This is just an example of enhanced rhizodegradation, where if you added a petroleum compound to soil and it was unplanted, you would see a profile like this. If you have a plant growing there, you can see very easily that the chemicals are readily degraded. This is an example of natural attenuation. This is a, um, it's an, it's an oil well. It had blown out. It's about uh, 51 or well, actually 61 years old now. The stories I'm going to tell you today go over the last 15 years. This particular oil well blew out about 61 years ago, and uh, initially nothing was there and nothing was done. But after a period of time, you have plants slowly working their way back into the ecosystem, and they end up remediate and degrading that, that oil, that petroleum hydrocarbon, and becoming very successful. You find some areas where you don't have anything growing, and that's because the contaminant concentration is very high there. And of course, what you can do is you can also look to see if any of these plants can be identified and selected for possible remediation of other kinds of contaminated sites. When you're dealing with plants like this, you want to focus on native plants that are acclimatized to the area where you're working. There's always a concern about introducing an exotic plant that might become uh, you know, a problem. It might become uh, escaped from that area and cause problems to other situations. So our research strategy is, and in fact, this is not just a strategy that we've been using for contaminated sites. This is a strategy that we've been using in agricultural production systems, is to characterize soil and root microbiomes, in this case, at contaminated and petroleum impacted sites. But in agricultural systems, we want to know who's there, who's associated with different crops, how might they change during the growing season, how might they respond to some kind of an introduced inoculant, and again, how can we manipulate them? In this particular work I'll talk about today, what we're interested in doing is identifying organisms that might be actually uh, used as bioinoculants to inoculate certain plants and help those plants remediate contaminants. What I want to do now is shift gears and give you a little bit of an example about some of the challenges. And I'm going to use a really extreme site. You may or may not be familiar with the fact that in Canada we have these oil sands. And they're probably the third largest deposits of oil in the world. And it's a very viscous oil, and it's associated with, uh, with sand, and it requires a lot of heat, energy, and water to extract the oil. And then, of course, it has to be refined for uh, you know, a product that can be used. Uh, and of course, as I've shown right here, it's um, about 1.7 to 2.5 trillion barrels of this oil sand. This is a, an, uh, an example in Alberta of an operation. I hope you can, uh, I think you can. This is huge. This, this is a, a pit that's several hundred meters deep. These little tractors that are uh, taking and digging out and hauling away the, uh, the bitumen, which is the raw material that has to be processed. These are tractors where the wheels are the size of this room. These are huge, huge pieces of machines. And so this is a really large problem. And so this is a picture of a, uh, a mine site. And you can see in the... Uh, your lower left-hand corner is a, is a waste pond. The water that's been used in the processing, the extraction of that oil, they have to put it somewhere. That's where it goes. It has some fine sand and clay particles in it, and they call it a tailing pond, and it takes years and years and years for that material to settle, but it creates a big problem. This is a, an example. This is a field, of, not a field, this is a site that's six kilometers in diameter. And so one of the main challenges of this kind of a site is the large, vo large area, the large volume. Uh, again, we're talking about moving uh, materials, uh, could be a cubic football, so 100 yards and, and 100 yards deep, 100 yards wide, moving that every day, 24 hours a day. 
And of course, the material also has a variety of challenges with it. It, uh, it can be saline, it can have uh, sulfur and other chemicals in it. They, you have these uh, fine, to fine tailing sands that I talked about. And of course, you have this overburden that has to be removed from the site. And if, uh, well, I'll get to it in a minute, I'll show you, but you have a boreal forest on top of the site and you're actually digging below the forest. Sometimes they scrape that forest off and they save it because they want to put it back on. Uh, high, closure, high closure expectations. The, the government expects you to return this site to some sort of a productive ecosystem with some capacity to support wildlife and uh, have water that can be filtered. And so very high expectation around how you return it to a productive system. Again, unprecedented scales. If I've done my calculation right, and I may or may not have, it's estimated that it's going to have a final footprint after everything is mined of about 5,000 square kilometers. And if, if I've done my calculation right, that's about seven cities the size of Bangalore. So that's a pretty big footprint to try to fix. So now I want to shift gears and I want to tell you three research stories. The first one is an abandoned flare, flare, flare pit on a farmer's field, an agricultural system. The second one is a really very interesting site. It's called the Bitumont Provincial Historical Site. I'll talk about it more in a few minutes. And the, the final one is the most interesting one. That's a reclaimed tailing pond. That goes back to that picture and that story I just told you. So this is a, a site, as I said, it was in a middle of a farmer's field in, in Canada. It's not uncommon to be driving down the road and find an oil well with small production on a farmer's land. And there's a, usually a tank, you can see a tank in the uh, far picture there. But this flare pit is where they burn off gas and you have a lot of hydrocarbon deposits there. And this was a problem and we had a research project trying to see if we could help remediate the system. And so what you can see here is that it went from that far left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner where we actually had plants growing on this site. We had a couple of different sites throughout the, uh, the country, but this one is the one I want to focus on. It's, a, as I said, it's in the middle of a farmer's field. It was a buried flare pit, about 1,700 cubic meters. It had about uh, 5,500 uh, uh, ppm or milligrams per kilogram of petroleum hydrocarbon. It was salty. It was um, very crusty. It was not a good material to work with. So we had our, a company that was collaborating with us. They came in, they brought in tractors, they excavated the uh, material, they put it into a, what we would call a raised bed reactor. So they created a field where we could actually put out our plot out and grow plants on it. What we discovered in growth chamber experiments and preliminary experiments is you couldn't get anything to grow in this material. So we had to amend it with fertilizer and gypsum. We had to add straw and it was a real mess to work on. And in fact, in the controls where you didn't do anything like that, it was walking like on cement outside. We had two unplanted treatments, one with and without fertilizer, and then we had two planted treatments. And the idea is that we were looking at different kinds of mixtures of, mixtures of plants to see if they would in fact be successful. One of the things that we discovered, and this is a take home message for any young scientist doing a field experiment, is uh, don't be surprised on spatial variability. So we had the field laid out, we mapped out our plots, um, we started planting things, and then we got the results back from the spatial distribution of petroleum hydrocarbons. And what we discovered is we had hot spots. As I said before, initially the material had about 5,500 um, ppm of petroleum hydrocarbon. We had some hot spots with an excess of 10,000 ppm. We had other spots that weren't that hot, they weren't that contaminated. And of course it's not uniform, and as a consequence it's gonna impact your research. This is just a summary slide. That little straight line is the average of all the various treatments. The thing I would point your attention to are the green uh, boxes or the green triangles. Those are the various plant mixes. And what we could see is that at the end of the day, after about three years, we had some reduction or fairly good reduction in petroleum hydrocarbon across all the plots. And in the case where we had planted uh, different plant mixtures, we had better degradation initially, but then at the end it kind of slowed down. And we weren't sure what was going on, so what we wanted to do was create some microplots to see if we could identify the factors that were influencing the degradation and why we weren't able to get complete degradation of those petroleum hydrocarbons. So we ended up setting up a little microplot with uh, four planted treatments. We had single plants, either alfalfa, uh, Alteri wild rye, a fall um, uh, wheatgrass. We also had mixtures of plants, uh, alfalfa, Alteri wild rye, and this tall wheatgrass. We had an unplanted control, and of course, we ended up sampling everything over two growing seasons every six weeks to see exactly what was going on. 
This is what the plot looked like. It was set up in July of 2004. You can see the results in September. And then as you go through the rest of the years, it was September of 2006 and July of 2006 on the bottom. And so you can see our little micro plots and the plants that are growing. This is what happened when we took a look at the petroleum hydrocarbon degradation. You can see that the uh, single mixture, that ulterior wild rye, was greater than any of the other plants. It was greater than the alfalfa. It was greater than the tall wheatgrass, which actually was equal to the unplanted um, control. And for whatever reason, the mixture of plants, the mixture of grasses and legumes that we used didn't actually do anything. So we were curious what was going on. And so what we ended up doing here, um, well, this is just a, a reminder for me that we want to talk about opportunities for grasses and legumes. And there's a nice little paper there that talks about the microbial communities that are associated with them. And what we ended up doing was actually looking at the endophytic bacteria that were able to degrade N-hexadecane in those plants. And what we could see is that there was actually a significantly um, different level, it was a greater level of these endophytic and hexadecane degraders associated with uh, the ulterior wild rye and the uh, alfalfa. The other thing that we did was to actually look at these grasses and these legumes by doing most probable number counts of uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon degraders. And what we discovered is that all the plant tissues ended up having, um, both in the rhizosphere and in the root tissues, ended up having these endophytic bacteria that were there. They were associated with the plants. And so what we want to understand, what we want to do, is see how we can manipulate those communities and how we can get them to degrade things in different systems than the system we have right here. What I want to do now is tell you a second little research story. This is the one about the survey of these bacterial root endophytes at this provincial park. Bitumont was, is that material that I showed you in Alberta, that viscous oil, where they spend billions of dollars taking it out of the uh, soil. And back in the 1920s, this was the very first site in Canada that was mining this material. And uh, it's actually about 100 kilometers north of that large field that I showed, not field, but that mine that I showed you earlier in my presentation. And about 1940, they closed it down. And this is what it looked like in 1940. And this is what it looked like when we went back to sample it um, a couple years ago. And so we had natural attenuation, we had plants that had come into the system, and we were very curious to understand what were the microorganisms that were associated with these plants. These are some of the sampling locations spread throughout the entire site. Various um, plants that were, that were actually at those sites. The quarry is where they had just dumped this, this raw bitumen right at the surface. They hadn't finished processing it, so it was a uh, sort of like a, an asphalt, a tar, and very, uh, very hard to uh, work with. But there were plants growing there, and so we ended up sampling plants from all those sites. And you can see from this slide the key take-home messages from the uh, quarry down to the riverbank. The, um, the PPM of uh, petroleum hydrocarbons range from about 2,400 down to about 350 or 330. These are just some of the, the vegetation that we sampled. And once we had that material, we brought it back to the lab. And what we ended up doing is using both culture-independent and culture-dependent techniques to try to understand what the microbial, right, microbial communities were associated with those plant roots. Uh, what they tend to say is that if you picked up a gram of soil, you could probably characterize, or I should say cultivate, 1% of the community, and 99.9% .9 of the community can't be cultured. And so we were doing uh, DNA extractions to uh, get the DNA out of the plant roots, out of the soil, and then using aluminum mice sequencing, uh, next generation high throughput sequencing, to characterize that sample and figure out what microorganisms were in there. At the same time, we were using culture-dependent techniques to try to isolate bacteria, and then we were going to screen them for the ability to degrade hydrocarbons, and then eventually to see if they could have an impact on plant growth and hydrocarbon degradation. This is just an example of some of the data that we found, and the real take-home message here is that as you looked at the various plants growing at the different sites, and without my glasses, I think we've got the... Uh, Low concentration of hydrocarbon on the upper left-hand y-axis all the way down to the quarry where you have the highest concentration of hydrocarbon. And what you see is in instances where you have the same plant growing at multiple sites, you do have different community profiles that you generate using this, uh, this high-throughput sequencing, these molecular techniques. 
And uh, you also find that's, that sometimes there are these large outliers where you've got some plant that seems to be dominated by one particular order of bacteria. And what we don't know and what we're trying to understand is what's going on, why is this in fact the case? The other thing that we did, as I said, was to culture these bacteria, to enumerate them, and we could see that there were communities in the rhizosphere of the soil. But more important is that we were able to detect communities of endophytes, bacterial endophytes that we were able to isolate. And we used Sanger sequencing, uh, 16S ribosome RNA sequencing, to identify these bacteria. And we found that many of them were representative of the things that we were detecting using our culture-independent techniques. So what we learned from this particular study is that all these plants had these interesting associated communities that we could isolate bacteria from them. What I didn't show you is that we actually surveyed those isolates for the presence of hydrocarbon de degrading genes and found that yes, they did have one or more hydrocarbon degrading genes. And what we're, what we're doing right now is testing them for um, their ability to be used as bioinoculants. And at the end of my talk, I'm gonna give you an example of how that actually happens. The final story that I want to talk to you about today is this oil sand reclamation strategy. And so I'm going back to that site in Alberta, that uh, Fort McMurray site, that large open pit. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's what the forest looked like before they started to mine. So that's the boreal forest. And you can see what happened where they started to actually come in. They scrape off the surface of the, of the forest. They, they store it on the side because eventually they're going to use it as a cover. And then they start mining it. They've got the, uh, the, the water, uh, um, the tailing pond that I was talking about, and it goes through a series of aging processes where eventually we get to 2012. And this is the site that I'm going to talk about right now. That's what it looks like when we started working on it. There were two sites. There was an engineered site and a non-engineered site, and these are the transects of those sites. And what happens is when the company comes in and wants to reclaim that site and try to get it into a state where they can get the government to say, yes, it's been reclaimed and it's now released for um, general use. They, um, they have this tailing sand that is a waste product. It has contaminants in it, something called naphthenic acids, very toxic. It gets into water. It can cause all kinds of problems. They have that uh, a peat mineral mix that they put on top and they start pl planting vegetation on top of that. The engineered site actually has a geotechnical layer about 100 meters, not 100 meters, 100 centimeters down to try to prevent the upward leaching of um, contaminants and salts from that tailing sand material that I just talked about a minute ago. We had these engineered and standard sites. We had those transects and the various points. And you could see the engineered site had more um, uh, petroleum hydrocarbon associated with it than the standard site. And we're not quite sure why, but a lot of variability across the field. And what we ended up doing, again, was going out and collecting plants. Uh, we used a variety of techniques to characterize the microbial community in the soil, um, phospholipid fatty acids. We used initially pyro sequencing, 454 pyro sequencing. Eventually, we, we moved over to the aluminum I seek to characterize the microbial community using independent, culture independent techniques. But we also isolated bacteria as we did at the Bitumon site and assessed who they were and whether or not they had various genes that could be used for uh, degradation of hydrocarbons. This is just a simple uh, density gradient gel electrophoresis profile to show you a comparison between the standard cover and the engineered cover. There were barley plants and clover, sweet clover, growing on the site. They planted barley initially in, in this field sort of as a cover to hold things down until the plants, the trees that they were planting could take establishment. And then the clover invaded. It was an invasive species came in, so it wasn't inoculated with rhizobia, and it, uh, but it became established. And so we were comparing the communities in both plants, and we were finding very, very similar profiles at, at both sites. We also found some unique bands that turned out to be interesting. Some of them were parasites of plants and seemed to be uh, carried by insect vectors. But if we use the, uh, the aluminum myceic, and took analysis of the uh, community, the uh, culture independent aspect of that community, we could see some big differences between the rhizosphere and endorhizosphere of barley. Uh, similarly, between clover, we could see differences. And of course, between the plants, we see different orders of bacteria that appear to be dominating the profiles. And when we actually plot it a different way, we can see on the um, on the far right, you have the, uh, the rhizosphere soil separating itself out from the, uh, 
the material close to the y-axis, which is the endosphere. These are the endophytic bacteria. So we have these very distinct communities of bacteria living both in the soil, outside the, the plant, and inside the plants. And of course, they also vary between the clover and the, and the, uh, the barley that was growing there. And if you analyze your data a different way and you generate a heat map of the, of the profiles, what you end up finding is that there are some specific groups of bacteria that are dominating the, uh, the communities and they're driving the analysis. So that's the fingerprint that you get and that's what's driving the other analyses that we were actually working with. As I say, we had isolated a variety of these endophytes to see if they could be used as inoculants and we had over 300 inoculants that, or I should say endophytes that we isolated and we screened them all for the presence of these three uh, hydrocarbon degrading genes and we ended up with 40 some odd isolates that had the ability to do that. We screened those in a variety of uh, assays, a seed germination assay, a root elongation assay, and then a greenhouse study to see if in fact they would uh, promote plant growth. And what we found is that if we grew them in, um, in, in a greenhouse, in soil that was uncontaminated, the endophytes were actually stimulating the growth of clover. And you can see the control on the far left-hand side. And of course, going across the screen, you can see these different isolates. They all contained at least one of the hydrocarbon degrading genes, and you were getting growth promotion in non-contaminated soil. So we set up a different experiment where we amended the soil with either 5,000, 10,000, or 20,000 um, ppm of petroleum hydrocarbon. In fact, it was just diesel collected from a gas station. And we asked the question, what would happen? This is a, a slide to remind me that I want to show you. This is just a profile of 50 ppm of diesel. And there are these two fractions, what we call F2 and F3. There are actually four fractions, F1, 2, 3, and 4. F1 is the volatile fraction of the hydrocarbon. F2 and F3 are the ones that are the most important concern to the Canadian Council of Scientific, uh, um, or not scientific, the Canadian Council of Environment, or Environment Ministers because these are the ones that are most toxic, and so these are the ones that we wanted to focus on when we were doing our analysis. This is an example. This, is, this, this experiment was set up with five different replicates uh, for each of the treatments. This is just one example. You can see the control there on your left, and then the various bacteria that we were testing, four different bacteria. This is in 5,000 milligram of diesel, um, well, 5,000 ppm uh, per, per a PPM in the soil, and you can actually see that where the plants are growing and doing quite well. This is what happens in 10,000 milligrams of, um, uh, or 10,000 PPM of uh, diesel per in the soil. You can see that the plants don't do very well, but the inoculated plants are doing much better than the uninoculated control. When you actually analyze the soil to find out what's happening with the uh, petroleum hydrocarbon or the diesel, that particularly the F2 and the F3 fraction, what you find is that nothing is happening in 5,000 ppm. There's no degradation, it's pretty constant. In the 10,000 and 20,000 ppm system, you're actually finding that you are getting significant differences in the total amount of the, um, the diesel. And when you actually break it down and take a look at the F2 and F3 fraction, and you can see the F2 is the blue bars and the F3 is that sort of yellow color in my eyes, you can see that the isolates are actually significantly degrading the F3 fraction in the, in the material. And so that's why we're getting the change in the hydrocarbons because the bacteria are helping the, the clover plants somehow degrade that particular hydrocarbon fraction. So the lessons that I think we've learned and the lessons that I hope you can take home from this little talk is that plants support a wide variety of root-associated bacteria and particularly root endophytes, that their abundance and community structure is influenced by the interaction of the plant that you're growing and the environment where that plant is growing, and that many of these endophytes can enhance plant growth either in contaminated systems but also in contaminated systems, and there's a great possibility that you can develop these uh, plant microbe associations for remediating contaminated sites. I want to thank all the people at the, in my lab and my colleagues that have been involved with this research and, of course, the funding agency, agencies that supported the work over the last 15 years. And I want to thank you for being a very attentive audience, and I hope I get a chance to answer any questions a little bit later. So thank you very much.